Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance <clears throat> Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. Treasury yields rise over growing credit risks, funding concerns, and heightened fears of default if Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling on time. Credit Suisse Chief Executive Ulrich Kerner will join the UBS Group Executive Board as a Swiss lender announces a broad management overhaul following the takeover. Plus, China imports plunge as concerns grow about the nation's economy. Asian stocks rise after export growth tops estimates. So you've guessed us, we're here in the French capital in Paris for the Bloomberg Future of Finance Paris Forum. Now business leaders and policymakers are here to explore the future of Paris as a financial center and of course the sustainability issues and tech innovations that are reshaping finance. We'll bring you interviews with chief executives including the chief executive officer of BNP Paribas, also Stéphane Bunja, Euronext chief executive. Now investors of course will be a very close eye uh, of course watching US President Joe Biden and congressional leaders as they're set to discuss the debt ceiling later today. PIMCO co-founder Bill Gross recommends buying short-term Treasury bills as he says the issue will be eventually resolved. I think it's ridiculous. Um, I, you know, it, it's always resolved and not that it's a 100% chance, but I, I think it gets resolved. I would suggest for those that are uh, less concerned, uh, similar to myself, that they, uh, you know, they buy a one-month uh, two-month Treasury bill at a much higher rate than they get with a longer-term Treasury bill. Now, for more on all of this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Managing Editor for Credit, Dana el -Bataji. Dana, thank you for joining us. So how big of a deal for global markets is the U.S. debt ceiling debate? It's huge, but are they really starting to worry about it? You're right. It's absolutely huge. But um, PIMCO is just the latest voice to basically come out and say how ridiculous the debate really is. At the end of the day, is the U.S. actually going to default? The chances of that happening are super slim. And as he points out, there's an unbelievable buying opportunity here. We're talking about yields that we haven't seen I mean, in, in a very long time, sometimes ever, we're talking about an extra 250 basis points that you can easily make within the next four weeks. I mean, that is quite a significant buying opportunity here. So, yeah, I understand that it's a big deal. I realize everyone is looking at it, but the odds of a default seem to be significantly low. Of course, that, those could be famous last words. Yeah, I think we also spoke to Philip Hildebrand a couple of weeks ago for BlackRock, and he says, look, there's slim chances that something turns ugly, but if it's ugly, it could be Armageddon. Uh, what does the Fed's latest senior loan officer opinion survey show? Um, it, seems, it seems to suggest that it, it is that it is quite low. But again, you, you know, I mean, I think ultimately what people are really looking at is U.S. CPI data, which is actually coming out tomorrow. If you take a look at the market today, it seems quite tame. That's mostly because at the end of the day, what people are most concerned with isn't necessarily this. It's mostly whether or not the U.S. is going to continue increasing rates, which is what we will probably see with the U.S. data tomorrow. Dana, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Managing Editor for Credit, Dana L. Bataji. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on the debt ceiling. Joining us is also Freya Beamish, Chief Economist and Head of Macro Research at T.S. Lombard. Freya, always good to speak to you, especially to, to cool off our hot-headed uh, market moves. When you look at the debt ceiling, like what kind of positioning should we do right now? Should we prepare for it and hope for the best, or is it very unlikely that we will come to anything too ugly? I mean, again, it can be famous last words, but we are working off of the assumption that something will happen probably at the last minute, which is kind of, you know, um, we're, we're approaching that that period. Um, so, yeah, we're working off of that assumption. That said, over the summer, there are a few kind of um, kind of headwinds and pitfalls for equities to get through, of course, the debt ceiling being being one of them. But I think more importantly is the sort of the the, re the point that we're reaching in the in the cycle, which is essentially that we're moving from the stage where inflation is driven by sort of all of the, the shocks that have fed through the system from COVID um, through, through, to, through to the energy to actually um, to the wage driven part of the cycle as is sort of right and proper for this for this stage of the cycle. But that's much more um, of a difficult thing for equities to, 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 to stomach. 
And that's that's why we're sort of cautious on equities in the in the near term. Um, but sort of looking beyond that, we do think markets have have broadly speaking got it right in terms of, of the direction and the kind of the, the magnitude of the of the Fed funds rate. Um, and it is a very forecast recession that that we are still kind of holding out for. Um, so we're looking for for equities to to sort of recover reasonably well, especially when you look at um, the the central bank impulse, which has already turned uh, in favour of asset prices, having been very much against asset prices Freya, um, through through twenty two. Yeah. Overall, what kind of asset prices will we be left with post recession? So, are there longer term legacy issues for inflation and higher returns? Yeah, so I think markets are very much, I'm glad you asked that, because for, for markets are very much um, getting things reasonably well right this year. But looking beyond that, that's where we have big concerns of over, over mispricing of asset prices. So this year, we think that there will be a recession, but markets are sort of getting it wrong as to what the causes of that recession are. It's about breaking the speed limit. There's a recession because um, the, the, the rapidity of the, the, the increase in interest rates has just been so rapid. Uh, so so strong that, that the economy can't can't stomach that. But the economy can stomach the level of, 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 of rates right now over a longer term basis and, and can potentially stomach higher yields over a longer term basis. The same with, with inflation, that inflation could come down quite precipitously this year um, and markets are kind of mm -hmm. getting that right, especially if you include shelter and the lagged effects of, of, of previous price uh, movements. But it's, it's again about the causes of that. The causes of that decline in inflation are about COVID distortions coming out of the system. It's not about the secular trends in inflation, which we think are picking up. And there's a whole host of kind of factors, factors that feed into that. But if you want a kind of a big picture idea as to where that comes from, you can think about the, reset, the, the imbalances that we see in the economy right now compared with the imbalances that we saw in the contrasted with the imbalances that we saw in the wake of the global financial crisis. In the wake of the global financial but crisis, Freya, so we also had yeah. no. We Sorry, also had okay. some really disappointing news out of China, and I don't know if you put that into context of what you're explaining beautifully about a credit crunch, but yeah. also a lot of the loans may be disappearing in the U.S. Could we have a perfect storm emerge all at once? I think we are looking at some more kind of global recessionary dynamics once you get through the kind of the the, the reopening in China. Um, so when so when we talk about the kind of the excess of, of, of debt in the global financial crisis, post global financial crisis in um, in the U.S., where that that excess of debt is now is very much in in China. So the U.S. had an asset cycle over the 2010s. They built a whole bunch of what I would call hollow financial assets over the course of the 2010s, and that's much more of an inflationary problem um, that is causing central banks to have to squeeze out inflation. Where the problem is in China is on the debt side of the balance sheet, and that's much more of a demand deflationary story. So when you get the reopening story right now, um, yes, by all means, that, that means uh, faster growth, much more services-led fast growth, which is why it's not showing up in the imports in the first half of the year. But in the second half of the year, there's nothing to sustain that, and there's the whole legacy of that debt um, imbalance to, to work out on the on the on the balance sheet side of things. Um, so there's there's the potential for the US to go into recession um, and the and China to, to slow um, quite precipitously towards the end of, of the year as well. And that puts you much more into kind of global um, recessionary dynamics. And, and what are the spillover effects actually of this China slowdown to neighboring countries and the rest of the world? So um, while the, the spillover effects of, of reopening are not particularly um, significant for the rest of the world because it's all about services and it's the first sort of cyclical pickup that's been led by the consumer sector as a result of this pent up demand, um, the, the significant, the effects of the slowdown, the secular slowdown are much, much more um, important. So the likes of the euro area, the likes of um, the kind of the export dependent EMs um, are very much tied into that kind of deflationary force that's emanating from China, whereas the likes of the US and the UK are much more exposed to the more inflationary imbalances that are there in, in those economies when you look at that excess of financial wealth um, compared with the, the, the capacity of the economy to, to provide for um, the, kind of the demand that, that that excess of wealth generates. So we have these kind of deep-seated um, mismatches between demand and supply that have to be worked out in the likes of the US and the UK and to an extent the euro area 
but the euro area is much more exposed to the, the slowdown in China. Uh, Freya, are you surprised, and I know this goes also into something that you mentioned with lending of, you know, coming from banks in the U.S. and the credit crunch that could potentially get worse, but it seems to have pretty much been contained, the fallout from, you know, some of the stress that we've seen in the U.S. banks. So again, famous last words, or do you think a lot of those worries are behind us? So I think with regards to small and kind of medium-sized banks in, in the U.S., the, the mechanism by which that would turn into a, a, a more serious kind of systemic problem is deposit flight. And there is a destruction of deposits in the economy as a result of, of QT and the mismatch between interest rates being offered by uh, banks and money market mutual funds. Um, so that kind of that aggregate story is still there. But in terms of, of how that manifests and whether that actually tips off the, the kind of the key, um, the, the tipping point for small banks and regional banks, um, it's it's force that would force them to, uh, to to sell down their held to maturity assets, and that that particular mechanism has now been disabled um, by by the Fed offering its new kind of um, term funding uh, program, which means that instead of having to sell those assets and and recognize the the quite large losses that are embedded in the balance sheet, um, they they can just go to, uh, to to this new to this new facility at the Fed. So that sort of cauterized the, the systemic nature of this, this um, again, could be famous last words, but of this of this part of the crisis. But where we are kind of more worried is when you get to kind of illiquid uh, and difficult to price assets more broadly in the economy. And that comes back to this idea of there being sort of hollow financial wealth that has essentially been created by the combination of um of, of large deficits through the 2010s and then again in the in the 20 in the pandemic period. Um, with the expansion of the central bank balance sheet, which is a perfect concoction to create this kind of financial wealth that doesn't really have a home in the real economy. In fact, it's created as a result of deficiency of demand in the real economy. So there's this big mismatch between financial yeah. wealth and the size of the real economy. And there's only a few ways that that can kind of come back into, into, kind of into balance, either through decline in prices um, in the uh, in the in in the financial world, or through increasing prices in the in the real economy, um, so it'll probably be a combination of both of those things. But that tells you that there's this sort of underlying inflationary, reflationary force in the real economy, but also this kind of propensity towards there being a denouement between um, the the level of financial asset prices uh, and the and the real economy. Yeah. The likelihood there's going to be higher inflation, higher yields deterioration of the geopolitical yeah, environment, which is why the energy transition, and all these things bringing them back into line. Thank you, Freya, which is why you say actually could emerge the US certainly and also the UK out of the recession to higher yields. Freya Beamish there, as always, wonderful analysis, chief economist and head of macro research at TS Lombard. Now coming up, we look at the banks. UBS has announced a reshuffle of its leadership after the emergency takeover of Credit Suisse. Who stays and who goes? We'll have all of the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. So UBS is actually appointing Todd Tuckner as chief financial officer. Of course, he replaces Sarah Youngwood as part of the management overhaul following the takeover of Credit Suisse. Now, this is the share price for the moment, getting some three-tenths of eight percent. Of course, when the deal closes, the bank says Credit Suisse chief executive Ulrich Kerner will also become a member of the UBS executive board. Not something that many were actually expecting, although we had found out that there were a possible conversations heading in those directions. So for more, let's get to Bloomberg's Manus Cranny, uh, who knows, of course, the story inside out. Manus, I don't know what that means. They think they're, they're just trying to create a war machine, right, to be, to be sure that they have all angles covered and they can move ahead in execution. I think you're right. I think it's a surprise that Kroner has stepped across. I mean, he's a veteran. He's had 10 years at both banks. He left in the reshuffle of 2019, Francine. Bear that in mind. Uh, he left during an Armati uh, shuffle. I think what you have here is a very clear delivery for continuity, people who Armati has confidence in, 
and people who've been loyal to the UBS machine. And I've worked with their multi through turbulent times of turning UBS itself around. Let's just look at some of those changes, Francine. If you're a veteran and you know what you're doing within UBS, you've been rewarded, you remain on this board. I find it interesting that uh, Rob Karofsky, who, has, you know, he's only been there since 2014, I say only, but he will lead the investment bank solely. And then the Dauphin, as I call him, which is Iqbal Khan, I'm sure that won't go down well at home in, in Switzerland, but he remains sole president <laughs> of the wealth management. So this is, about, this is about continuity. But I think when it comes to Kroner, uh, of course, this is about the transition from what remains within Credit Suisse to come across for a phased period and a pivotal point in time. And there are some pretty significant female leads here as well, Francine. Just to give you some context, Michelle Berrault, she is head of transition and integration, 23-year veteran at UBS. So you could say herself and Armati are very closely aligned. Francine. Manus, when you look at, of course, how, you know, again, this is an integration that we're hoping legally, I think, will be done in the next couple of months. But then we also heard from the chairman of UBS that this will take maybe three, four years. It's extremely complex. Is it too soon to, to try and figure out, because, you know, this happened six weeks ago, is it too soon to, to figure out how it's going so far? I think it probably is. It's presumptive. And I mean, one thing which Armati was very clear about when we sat down and, you know, listen to the tone in his voice. I'm glad you've met a few people that know how to run a Swiss bank, Manus. Maybe, maybe you'd like to introduce them to me. Um, facts, not emotion, will run the thinking of Armati. And if you look at the complexion of this, as you say, a war cabinet, almost a group of individuals, men and women, who will quite literally take this organization by the neck uh, and reinvent who they are and what they are. Uh, to that extent, this is about creating um, a group of people who know one another very well, who know how to do the job. And I think where we are, Francine, with this right now, it's too soon to say what it is. A hundred people have gone in there. We know the advanced posse, the advanced team are looking under the hood. I think when we get to the end of July on the next set of numbers, the market is going to want to know something really quite significant about what bad assets you're going to tank. And here's the thing. The structure will have five core parts. Wealth, investment banking, personal corporate banking, investment banking, and you got it. It's back at the top of the charts. Non-core bank. And that will be headed by Beatrice uh, Jimerez, and she is a veteran of over 10 years. You're right. It's back in the top five on the billboard. The bad bank is back. And that is how quickly and aggressively that will be run down. The assets, as you and I have talked about several times, and the parts of the bank, Credit Suisse, that Ermotti et al. do not want. Yeah, and, and I know we both know Beatrice, so force to be reckoned with, I think, is how many people would describe her. Thank you so much, Manus Cranny, there with the very latest on UBS. Coming up, we'll have plenty more on some of the big corporate stories we're following. Saudi Aramco says it's well positioned to cope with fluctuating prices, and this is despite slightly disappointing first quarter sales. We'll have the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance, economics, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris. We look today at the future of finance from Paris. But before we do any of that, and we also get to the earnings out of Aramco, let's check on the markets. And a bit of a wobble is probably how I would describe it. It's not a technical term, but it does feel that way, certainly when you look at the last 24 hours. So European stocks, U.S. equity futures edging lower, investors again assessing the impact of slowing imports by China on its economic recovery. A lot of questions mark on what that looks like in the next three and six months. They also are preparing for a key U.S. inflation report. Now, real estate shares seem to be leading the declines in Europe, with Swedish landlord SBB falling to the lowest in nearly nearly five years after the company announced plans to postpone a dividend, but also cancel a rights issue intended to shore up its finances. On to another corporate, and Aramco says it will pay a performance-linked dividend, potentially boosting payouts for the Saudi Arabian government by billions of dollars. Now, this also comes as the world's largest energy company reports a miss on the first quarter operating profits. So to round up all of the numbers, let's get straight to Bloomberg's energy and commodities leading leader, He's Paul Wallace. Paul, great to speak to you. So will this dividend announcement actually mean more money for shareholders, not least the Saudi government? 
High front scene, it certainly looks that way. We've already started to get some numbers coming through and forecasts coming through from analysts and we've got Bloomberg Economics saying that this could boost the dividend which um, already stands at about $76 billion by $20 billion or more. RBC Capital Markets is predicting $12 uh, billion to $18 billion of additional payouts from, from the company. So this is looking like a pretty, good move, a pretty big move um, from Aramco and we've already seen a stock surge this morning. The shares were initially up by about 7%. They've sort of trimmed games a bit but um, that just sort of shows you um, that investors are pretty excited by this. So, Paul, what does the government, you know, does the government actually need more money from Aramco? Well, it will certainly, um, if, um, if oil prices stay where they are for the rest of the year and Aramco follows through on this, on this plan for sort of performance-linked uh, dividends, then it will mean a lot more money for, for the government, which directly uh, owns 90% of the company. And with oil prices dipping, yeah, it could do with the additional money. Yeah. Paul, thanks so much. Paul Wallace in Dubai. Now, coming up, we'll have, of course, a deep dive into finance. This is Bloomberg. U.S. Treasury yields rise over growing credit risks, funding concerns, and heightened fears of default if Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling on time. Credit Suisse chief executive Ulrich Kerner will join the UBS Group Executive Board as the Swiss lender announces a broad management overhaul following the takeover. Plus, China imports plunge as concerns grow about the nation's economy. Asian stocks rise after export growth tops estimates. So good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Now, also joining us in Paris a little bit later on is, of course, JP Morgan with their Capital Markets Forum. Business leaders have offered a gloomy assessment of London's place in the league table of global financial centers. Now, Jan Duplessis, chair of the Financial Reporting Council, even blames this on a series of factors, including over CO, lower CO pay and over reluctance to embrace change. Meanwhile, the Revolut, Co-founders actually told the Times newspaper they would not consider listing in London. Now, ahead of their capital markets forum in Paris, let's discuss all of this. The attractiveness, of course, of London, what's in the pipeline with one of the most powerful bankers in London. This is Viswas Raghavan, JP Morgan's EMEA chief executive, um, live, of course, from their chief uh, executive officer event in London. Viz, always great to speak to you because you always make me smarter on the ins and outs of a lot of these financial centers. How do you see London growing or not growing as a financial cent center in the next five to 10 years? Uh, morning, Francine. So, so look, I think, I think I would put the factors uh, surrounding London into two buckets, you know, the controllable and the uncontrollable. Um, if I look at the uncontrollable bucket, I mean, clearly there are geopolitical shifts uh, which are not favoring listings, I mean, not just in London, but, but across Europe. Uh, remember, historically, London has been a big ma magnet for emerging market listings, for developing economies. So Russian companies used to list their GDRs and, and do some main listings, uh, companies from India, emerging markets, etc. You know, a lot of that is kind of disappeared. Uh, China is more domestically focused, A-share to H-share listings. And, and clearly, there is Brexit. So clearly, Brexit has kind of cannibalized the kind of the listing pool. A lot of European companies are now uh, listing on, on, on uh, European exchanges. So there are a bucket of factors which are put in that kind of uncontrollable bucket. But within the kind of increasing the attractiveness kind of quotient in the controllable bucket, clearly London has historically, you know, been a, a, a great money center. Uh, and the rule of law, uh, uh, quality of regulation, I think that is a, that's a huge plus. Uh, the FCA's uh, reforms, uh, proposed reforms around regulation, uh, the Edinburgh reforms, I think what, what uh, is being considered is kind of making sure that we don't gold plate it and, and keep the attractiveness kind of alive. And then mm -hmm. clearly the, the pool of talent, the international multicultural talent, that needs to continue. And, and also, mm -hmm. most importantly, um, you know, if London continues to be a magnet for entrepreneurs who 
uh, who create jobs, who create wealth for themselves, for their employees. If that kind of uh, magnetism and the attractiveness of, of London continues, then clearly I think the, the, the out, outlook could be, uh, uh, could be positive. But it's very important that those controllable factors this, are, are, we are on top of those. Yeah, and at the same time, there's been a lot of pushback, for example, because of the CMA's, you know, decision on Activision Microsoft. So are, are you worried that we're going to have a less favorable regulation that will take business away from London? And what does that mean for JP Morgan? I mean, look, I wouldn't read too much into the, the, the CMA's uh, decision on Microsoft. I think you have to evaluate these on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, uh, you know, the UK happened to be first. It could have been uh, the EU markets uh, authority or it could have been the, the US uh, kind of uh, regulators. So you, you cannot infer too much or extrapolate from just kind of the Microsoft uh, decision. And, and, and really, there are a lot of other factors that go into it. I, I think that the, the key is really all the factors that made London kind of a magnet and a, and a hub for global capital, that global money center, the advantage of the time zone, that attractive, you know, that attraction of, you know, top talent. We've got to keep doing all of that while making sure that, you know, it is a, a, a very kind of a proactive and a, an environment that fosters entrepreneurship and really kind of look to, mm -hmm. you know, the green economy, you know, technology, life sciences, really as a, as a, as a, as a magnet. Because also, you know, what, what, is, what, what we cannot underestimate is it, when, when you look at valuations, especially from a U.S. perspective, there is a valuation uplift to be had from, uh, you know, compared from a London uh, domicile to kind of, you know, re-domiciling to the, yeah. the U.S. And, and some companies have trod that, that route. So I think that, that is something which, you know, uh, companies really are considering and evaluating all of the time. Okay. But Viz, so for you, for example, since Brexit, do you have to duplicate costs because you have to have a, fub, a hub um, also in Europe? And how sustainable is that? I, th I think there is an uh, there is an element of of duplication, but from a listing point of view, remember as a as a board, as a CEO, as a management team, and for the shareholders, the key is to access as many pools of liquidity as possible so that you know your stock your equity story your investment thesis is getting the widest audience you're getting an active following so and and really kind of you know benefiting in terms of valuation so the the key drivers there are are really having a as broad a following you know for your investment thesis for your equity story and and getting the kind of the valuation uplift in terms of you know, whether it is two exchanges, if there is an increase in cost, whether there is duplication, I think it is really around the fringes. I think the key here is uh, having a broad following and that you are really kind of trading at the multiple that you deserve and, and that your stock uh, and your story justifies. In terms of business, Fizz, when are you expecting the pipeline to pick up, deal making to pick up, and if not returning to maybe more normal levels, certainly better trends that we're seeing now? You, you know what? I think I'm, I am really half full on that. Uh, if you look at investment banking, kind of the fee pool, uh, before COVID, the global fee pool was around 80 billion or thereabouts per year. And through 2021, 22, 2021, that fee pool, you know, absolutely catapulted to around $135 billion. And that was really fueled by a lot of liquidity in the market. There was kind of uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, central bank money uh, and, 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 and a lot of kind of COVID-related uh, stimulus. And what you saw through uh, 2022 was that fee pool shrink, so we're back at around kind of the, the mid, you know, 75 billion or thereabouts. And when you look at the, you know, the, the pipeline, you know, we've seen a bout of successful IPOs, both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, you know, the debt markets are selectively opening up. And the M&A market, really, I think it, it, it has got, uh, you know, it's showing signs of life. So it, it is not going to go back to the kind of the, the glorious 2021 type volumes. But, you know, it, it is not as bleak either. You know, there is value. Uh, and there is also a kind of a, a meeting of minds between buyer and seller. And there is a kind of a, a valuation kind of matching that, it kind of, that is slowly taking shape. So the, 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 the glass seems 
more half full than than half empty and for the right names you know for the right stories you know the, the capital markets are wide open yeah. um are private markets a way in for banks or are they too dangerous just because of the lack of liquidity and where we are in the cycle and the possible credit crunch coming I mean, I mean, look, I think when you talk about banks, what we saw around kind of SVB and Signature and First Republic, it's, it's a bit idiosyncratic. It was kind of uh, those were unique situations. There was kind of a, uh, an asset liability kind of mismatch situations. If you take broad banking, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 there are generally, you know, whether it is the United States or in Europe, the, the, the large banks are all uh, prudently capitalized, they're in good shape. Uh, and, and, and so I, I would say, you know, generally credit conditions are, are tightening. Uh, there is uh, selectivity. Uh, there is selectivity. You know, liquidity generally in the market is a lot more selective. Uh, there is a flight to quality, but that is to be expected given where we are in the economic cycle. That is kind of, you know, quite, uh, quite natural. Uh, but, but overall, I would say, you know, if you, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the broad kind of market, you know, you, you are seeing uh, a, a general kind of tightening and, and, and investors, boardrooms are, are naturally cautious mm -hmm. given uh, the economic prognosis. Um, if it's just one of final question on the rollout of Chase, how's that going elsewhere? So outside the UK, are you still planning the, the Germany launch and what happens after Germany? So look, I mean, Chase in the UK is, is, is really going uh, extremely well. Uh, we, we have uh, way over a million customers and, and we're doing really well on, on, on deposits. And, and, and as, you, as you know, you know we are, uh, we, we've been hiring in, in, in Berlin. Uh, I cannot comment on what the next kind of phase of uh, expansion looks like, but the reasoning behind, uh, you know, hiring folks in, in, in Berlin is really kind of to make that kind of the, the center mm -hmm. for whatever our European plans end up being. But overall, uh, a fantastic, fantastic start, and, and, and really uh, it, it, it has been uh, a, a kind of a, 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 great, uh, a great story in terms of you know, the number of jobs we've created in the UK, we've hired, you know, more than a thousand people now. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been, it's been a, a fantastic uh, start to chase. Viz, thank you so much. Viz was Raghavan, the EMEA Chief Executive Officer at JP Morgan, uh, joining us for an exclusive conversation on banking and Paris and the UK and, of course, Berlin. Coming up, we'll touch on this week's MLive poll survey, asking which developed economy will suffer the most in 2023. Spoiler alert, it's not looking great for the Brits. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. I don't think there's enough real growth for everything to work. Our expectation for actually GDP growth is just above 1% for this year, but pretty much a flat 2024. And that is concerning. The UK is showing tremendous resilience. Um, it's a very stable position for us in the UK bank at the moment. In Australia, we're taking a bit longer to get back to the inflation target than is the case in some other countries. What we see in Europe, we basically qualify it economically as, as look true. Yeah? So we don't see a recession coming. We basically see uh, some, some growth, even if it can be a bit sluggish. Well, this week's MLive poll survey focused on the world's biggest economies ahead of the G7 finance ministers meeting this week. Now, the other thing, of course, we're focusing on is what happens to living standards in the UK. Now, to go through all of the results is our Bloomberg senior reporter, John Stepick. John, good morning. You're great at putting all these things together and making us look good or not. But actually, for the Brits, it's just not looking great full stop, or is it? That's a, that's a bit of a spoiler alert there, uh, Fran. But, um, yeah, so we asked this <laughs> question of our readers. Um, you know, which country do you think is going to see the biggest drop in living standards, as in the biggest fall in real wages? And by far, uh, the most votes went to the UK. Roughly 60% said it's the, it's the UK, with Italy being a distant second. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, it's interesting because obviously the UK is actually doing an awful lot better than anyone expected nine months ago. You know, back then, everyone was saying we'd be in a recession. Bank England was saying it'd be the longest recession 
essentially in living memory. Um, and as it turns out, we're, we're not in recession and growth is not great, but it's not awful. However, it's very clear that the cost of living crisis is still front of mind. And I think we probably saw that reflected in the local election results last week. So what does this mean for investment implications, John? How do readers feel about investing in the UK? Well, again, the interesting thing there is, so we basically we locked the readers in a room and said, you have to invest in a UK asset. So in the FTSE 100, FTSE 250, gilts, or UK, house, UK houses. Um, anyone who wants to buy a house right now will probably be pleased to hear that no one wanted to uh, invest in UK residential property. Um, but the most popular investment was the FTSE 100. Now, what's interesting about that, of course, is that the FTSE 100 is not really a UK investment. It's certainly not an investment in the UK economy. It's an investment in global companies that happen to be listed in the UK. Um, and so it's, it's sort of, it reflects the same grumpy sentiment that we saw in the first question. John, thank you so much, as always, for all of the analysis. Bloomberg Senior Reporter and Money Distilled Newsletter author. It's a really good newsletter, so I urge everyone to go and um, actually sign up to it. So John Stepek joining us this morning on the MLive survey. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash with Sarah Halls. Hi, Sarah. Thank you, Fran. Aramco will introduce an additional dividend, potentially boosting payouts for Saudi Arabia's government by billions of dollars. It comes at a time when weaker oil prices are pushing the kingdom's budget into a deficit. Aramco says the new dividend will be between 50 and 70 percent of the company's annual free cash flow. China's export growth slowed last month, while imports plummeted, adding to pressures on its economic recovery. According to official data, imports dropped almost 8 percent in the year to April, much worse than the median projection of a 0.2 percent decline. Exports grew 8.5% over the same period, partly due to a favourable comparison with last year, when much of the country was under lockdown. PayPal shares fell in extended trading after the company lowered its adjusted operating margin forecast. The payments giant says it now expects the margin to grow by about 100 basis points this year, lower than its earlier forecast of 125 basis points. The weak guidance overshadowed PayPal's first quarter earnings beat and its higher full-year profit forecast. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls, and this is Bloomberg. Fran. Thank you so much, Sarah. Now, Goldman Sachs is to pay $250 million to settle a gender pay case. That's after it struck a deal with 2,800 women who filed a class action lawsuit claiming they were systematically underpaid. Now, the trial would actually have provided rare testimonies about inequality in the finance industry. So to dig a little deeper into some of these inequalities and how far or how not far we've come is Ruth David, our London bureau chief who joins us now. So, Ruth, good morning. Tell us a little bit more about the case. Morning, Fran. So, as you said, this has been one of Wall Street's most public and most long-running cases when it comes to gender and pay discrimination. If you recall, Christine Chen, Christina Chen Oster, who was the key plaintiff here, she first filed a complaint in 2005. And she could go to court only in 2010. And it, was, it took her another eight years to get more, about 1,400 more associates and VPs added on to that complaint. And that number has now grown to 2,800. This is a pretty large chunk of women that are saying we have been discriminated against in the workplace. And we have been given less pay. There was also a claim to talk about how it's a boys club which was rejected because the judges said that you need to that's not going to come into a class action lawsuit but the fact that Goldman has settled so, if you think about what the bank is trying to do is not very surprising so Ruth, I was going to ask what what will Goldman do next well so the money, if you, you know, 215 million looks like a lot, but put it in context, we are excellent reporter Sridhar Natarajan, who was talking about Goldman Sachs and who broke this story as well, was saying that in November 2022, there was a partner who had sued Goldman and they did a 
confidential settlement for 12 million. I think the bigger thing to keep in mind is they're saying they'll get an independent expert in, they'll look at their promotions process, they'll look at pay for the next three years. And that in terms of institutionally changing these organizations, keep in mind that six of the biggest US banks, only one of them has had a female CEO ever. That seems to be more of a win effect than just the money that we're talking about here. Ruth, thank you so much. Our London Bureau Chief there, Ruth David. Now, coming up, we'll have Thanks. plenty more on geopolitics. Putin fans the flames of nationalism and looks to rally more support behind the war in Ukraine and his Victory Day remarks in Moscow's Red Square. So we'll discuss more on that next, and this is Bloomberg. Vladimir Putin said the world is at a turning point, speaking at today's Victory Day parade in Red Square in Moscow. Now, the Russian president used the occasion to mobilize support for the war in Ukraine, claiming the conflict had been unleashed on Moscow. Now, this year's festivities have been overshadowed by security concerns in other areas of the country. So for expert analysis, let's bring in Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Roz Matheson. Roz, you always make us smarter on these very complex issues that has to do with geopolitics and foreign policy. How has the big parade differed from previous years? Well, mainly it differed in size. What we saw is a lot of troops marching up and down, but we only saw one tank, an antique tank, which usually appears at these parades anyway, but no other armoured cars, no series of tanks, no flybys by warplanes, and certainly no big missiles on display. And the reality is all that kit is being used at the moment for, for, for Putin's war in Ukraine, so you had less of it to put on display in Moscow today. And, of course, there were other parades that were cancelled uh, in other parts of Russia really to kind of collate what he had uh, to put on display in the Red Square this morning. So what we saw is a really slimmed down display in terms of the machinery that was there. Certainly we saw the usual troops marching by and so on. A lot of patriotic comments from the Russian president in his short address at the start. But if anything, what it highlights is the toll that this war has taken on Russia's military establishment. So what are your main, main key takeaways, Ross, from Putin's comments? I mean, he says it's, it's not Russia's fault, and that's basically to rally support from his, from his people. Well, that's right, and that's the narrative he's been adopting for a while now, which is that Russia is fundamentally under attack from the West, and therefore this war is about that. It's really a change in narrative from the early days of the conflict when he was talking about reclaiming territory that he said was fundamentally Russian. So now he's casting it very much for a domestic audience that Russia is under siege from the West. This is about NATO, this is about the US, this is about all these countries who are really seeking to contain Russia and push it back. And that's really, really aimed at the domestic audience inside Russia, of course, you know, more than a year into his war. He's still on the back foot on the ground in Ukraine. No great signs of tangible progress there. So he really needs to rally the Russian people by saying, you know, you have to join forces with me here because it's us against the rest of the world. And that really is a repeat of the, nar the narrative we've seen of late from him. Ross, thank you so much, as always, for your expert analysis, Ross Matheson. Coming up, we'll have plenty more from Paris at the Future of Finance. Clearly, the risk is that, you know, inflation is going to prove a lot more sticky than people are currently expecting. I don't think there's much of a chance to get back to 2% uh, absent a severe deflation. It's a 3 to 4% environment going forward for me. I'm not sure that rate hikes actually causes inflation to go down. I think the Fed should, and central banks in general, should be using more tools, not just the rate hike tool. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. U.S. banks reported tighter standards and weaker demands for loans in the first quarter. That was before some of the recent stress in the banking sector emerged. UBS is overhauling its top management team following the takeover of Credit Suisse. The CFO is being replaced and Credit Suisse CEO Ulrich Kerner will join the UBS executive board. And a crucial meeting at the White House today over the debt limit stalemate. Senator Republican leader Mitch McConnell 
McConnell says he's not coming to President Biden's rescue with some secret plan. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Kriti, it is very good to see you on the programme. And of course, we have a big focus on the US debt limit this week and the extent to which any political so solution can be found there as we work our way towards the data point, which has got to be US inflation tomorrow. It absolutely is, Anna. A pleasure to be with you always. It's all about Washington. The idea here that's not just about the inflation numbers that we are going to get, but also to your point, that debt ceiling story. Interesting, all eyes on Washington right now. But if you look at what the market's doing, Anna, the answer is not a ton. Take a look at futures right now, only down three tenths of one percent, not seeing real momentum, real conviction. Uh, and even as the market does sell off, you see a lot more action on the micro front than the macro. Even the two year yield kind of shrugging his shoulders a little bit because look, Anna, this can go in any direction when it it comes to just how Washington approaches this debt ceiling or if we are going to really go to the 11th hour there two year old hovering around 398 kind of a pullback from that 4% level but remember that technical level is key when we talk about the trade what's interesting is even as yields come down across the curve you are seeing the dollar just marginally higher uh, a tune of one tenth of 1% really a function of probably what's going on abroad uh, NYMEX crude trading at a 72 handle Anna this is the asset that I really have my eye on because if you are worried about inflation really quickly turning into a a recession commodities are really where that's going to show it's going to be the very first pain point and right now we're still at a 72 handle we haven't quite uh, started ringing those alarm bells how much of that is a question of demand and supply as opposed to really trading in line with resentment Right, let's have a look uh, with that in mind. And I pulled out the uh, oil price as well, Chrissy. So that's uh, a feature of the European story today. Let's have a look at what's going on on the equity markets, though. Uh, negativity, fairly gloomy red picture across these European equity markets this morning. Uh, down by six tenths of one percent catches my eye over in the Paris market. And broadly speaking, across Europe, we are pretty risk on most sectors in negative territory. And in fact, sentiment seems to have deteriorated as we've gone through the first couple of hours of the European trading day. Let me pull out one stock uh, for you that really represents some of the tensions we're seeing in the real estate sector and as rates have gone higher in Europe the Swedish property market has been held up as a, an early example of what can happen uh, in terms of the tensions in the property market and I will not at all attempt to say the full name in Swedish of this business I do apologize to Swedish viewers but I can't just go there SBB is what it's often known as and this is a business that operates in the commercial real estate sector and they've had to pause their dividend this on the back of a downgrade to their debt yesterday that came from the ratings agency S&P so as a result of that a lot of eyes on SBB Will this be something of a canary in the coal mine uh, for the tensions that we see in the Swedish property sector and elsewhere? How much could that spread? Now, this is Pearson. This is a, a, a publishing business. It's been really under pressure of late. We've seen a couple of days where this, uh, this stock has really come under pressure as a result of what rivals have been saying uh, or the market suspects will happen in the face of uh, artificial intelligence and generative AI in particular. Now, the company has confirmed its guidance today and said it is working to, a com uh, to uh, work a generative AI. AI into its business model. So as a result, Pearson goes higher by 2.6%. We have an interview with Martins Kazax over at the ECB, and that's really interesting when you think about how long the ECB will keep hiking rates for, even if the Fed is on pause, and we'll see if that comes to pass. But the euro is down two tenths of one percent, despite the fact that Martins Kazax says that the Fed, uh, so, sorry, the ECB can keep hiking, even if not just that the Fed pauses, but even if the Fed cuts. Uh, that's his view. And this is Brent Crude, Chrissy. You were mentioning WTI. It is down by eight tenths of one percent, Brent Crude, 76. We started last week it's uh, around $80 a barrel. We got nervous about the global growth story and we dropped down to around $73 a barrel, it seems. Uh, then for the last couple of days, we have seen some, uh, some movement to the upside as a result of concerns around wildfires in Canada and what that does to supply. But right now, uh, it's, been, it's been a very volatile picture. Certainly a lot to keep an eye on, both on the macro and the micro front. But let's get back to the macro here. The Federal Reserve saying U.S. banks reported tighter standards and weaker demand for loans in the first quarter. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now with the detail on this Fed survey. Look, Danny, we never pay attention to uh, the SPLU's report, and yet here we are, all eyes on them yesterday. Uh, what did we find out? Pretty, come on, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to the slews always. Uh, look, <laughs> part of what we saw was this big debate unfurling. Just how bad was it? One camp saying, look, uh, it was already really tight before SVB or it was getting tighter, so what's a bit of incremental tightness? But we did see a net 46 percent of banks have further tightening. So that's an additional amount of what we saw after last quarter. So it, it does just show that conditions remain tight and the longer they do so the more 
borrowers will be hit. Um, Cameron Christ also has a really good read on this, too, that it's not necessarily just about these tighter conditions. It's about the demand picture. That has just completely evaporated. It, it, it is a dynamic that's more commiserate with a recession. So, again, that supply and dy uh, demand dynamic really is what we should be focusing on here. Yeah, really interesting, isn't it? Because on the demand side, yes, yeah, some voices, Goldman Sachs, I think, were calling for that number to, to, to sorry, on the uh, supply side, to jump to 60% or so. Mm. We didn't see that, but we did see, as you say, uh, this drop-off in demand for credit. Now, what about uh, other measures of credit tension in the U.S. economy? We've heard from the Fed, haven't we? A financial stability report. Yeah, financial stability report. I did think you were going to go to Goolsby yesterday, who said he was getting vibes uh -huh. uh, of tighter credit. He did say the word vibes. That's not me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how we measure that. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, and you'd hope the Fed would measure more than just, just vibes. Um, but, yes, there was the financial stability report. Um, maybe this is kind of vibes, too, because they say, look, given the economic outlook, given concerns about credit deterioration, concerns about funding liquidity, that perhaps we will see a contraction in the supply of credit to the economy. Now, to be clear, this is not a forecast. They're simply just laying out their biggest risk. So they're not saying, okay, this definitely will happen. That's also highlighted a few other things, some structural vulnerabilities in short-term markets, uh, be that stable coins, be that money market funds. Also some concerns when it comes to office real estate, saying that uh, it stepped up the monitoring of CRE loan performance and banks with some of that commercial real estate exposure. Okay, Danny, thanks very much. We're with Danny Berger with the latest on the credit credit focus that we keep uh, stateside, of course, and that's certainly part of the conversation this morning. Let's get to other uh, measures of tension within credit markets. And SBB, one of Sweden's biggest commercial landlords, plans to halt payments of its dividend after suffering a ratings cut. Now, the ratings cut came yesterday in session, but uh, but the new news, inf new information overnight was the cut in the dividend. Uh, joining us now is Anton Weiland uh, in Stockholm, who can give us details of what happened here and why? Because this is a story that's getting quite a lot of international attention, Anton. Yes, so um, shares are down today and was already down a lot yesterday after uh, its uh, credit rating. This uh, company, which holds a lot of public properties and uh, residential homes too, it was downgraded to junk by S&P. And this really puts um, focus on the issues for Swedish real estate firms, which holds a lot of bond debt maturing this year. They have some $41 billion of bond debt maturing uh, within five years, and a quarter of that is due this year. So, Anton, for the reasons you just stated, it's kind of seen as a bellwether or, or some sort of canary in the coal mine for not just Swedish real estate, but European, uh, the European property sector broadly. But put this into some context for us. When it comes to Swedish real estate specifically, just how bad is it? Is this an isolated incident? Well, the thing with Swedish property firms is that they have taken on a lot of debt to grow quickly in the past years when rates were low. The problem is that debt is short and with floating interest rates, so they're particularly sensitive to rising rates. And what happens now is that bond market is too expensive to finance on, and they will seek bank funding, but banks in Sweden are already exposed to this uh, industry. So um, other options are halting dividends, as we saw last night, also selling assets. One issue with this is what will happen to property valuations if we see fire sales. So alternatives are quite few for Swedish property firms at the moment. Anton, thank you very much. Anton Weiland uh, in Stockholm for us on that developing story around SBB. And it sort of taps into broader concerns globally around uh, commercial real estate, other parts of the real estate uh, sector in focus as well, as rates have been rising so quickly, of course. Now, uh, sticking with uh, financial services news, UBS is overhauling its top management team following the takeover of Credit Suisse. Marion Haftemeyer joins us, Bloomberg Finance reporter uh, in Zurich with the details. Uh, tell us what stands out to you in terms of the management changes, I suppose the CEO of Credit Suisse staying on is quite a big deal. It is a big deal. What stands out most to me is that Sergio Amati, the new UBS CEO, is really sticking to personnel that he knows well from his time running the bank uh, two years ago. Um, so we, we see a lot of executive changes this morning, and they are all UBS personnel from internal. And then Willie Kerner, if you'll remember, uh, the Credit Suisse CEO, was actually a former executive of UBS as well. So he's really sticking to people who he knows he doesn't have to get up to speed with, who he can trust, and who can probably 
jump very quickly into making this integration work. Well, talk to us a little bit about this credit Suisse side as well, because not only is there a shakeup on the UBS side, but Zoltan Pozar, a heavily followed strategist, exiting the firm. What do we know about that? So we've, we've seen a lot of high-profile people leave Credit Suisse before the merger and in the wake of the merger. Uh, he is yet another high-profile name. We had Michael Strobeck, one of the lead strategists for the chief investment offices of Credit Suisse, also leave recently. Um, so that's not great. That means UBS isn't able to retain some of these key, really high-profile people that would have made this merger and this franchise even better. Marian, thank you very much. Bluebergs, Marian Haltemeyer in Zurich. I'm very pleased we got to uh, fix the microphone there as well. But we got uh, the gist of what Marian was telling us. Really interesting story to watch as that develops, as the integration uh, comes into, into force. Now, coming up on the program, Aramco introduces an additional dividend. We will dive into the oil giant's first quarter results next, what that means for the business, for oil markets, and for the Saudi state. And Rikaya Ibrahim joins us, Daily Insights strategist at BCA Research. So much to talk about around the debt ceiling, around the Fed narrative, when does she expect expect the Fed to move uh, and in which direction on rates. We'll get to that shortly. Plus, Washington tries to break the debt ceiling impasse today. We will speak with Greg Valier, Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Vladimir Putin vowed to pursue his invasion of Ukraine, accusing the Kremlin's enemies of seeking to dismember Russia. Putin spoke at the start of the annual military parade celebrating the Soviet victory in World War II. He said that a real war has been unleashed against the motherland. Goldman Sachs will pay $215 million to settle a long-running class action lawsuit on underpaying women. The case involved about 2,800 female associates and vice presidents. It was closely watched in an industry where women have long said that complaining of unfair treatment can derail careers. In China, more pressure on an economic recovery that's already been called into question. Export growth slowed last month to 8.5%, which beat expectations. Meanwhile, imports plummeted almost 8%. Economists warn that the strong export figures aren't likely to last forever. Shipments are expected to drop this year. And in the UK, mortgage rates have started to head higher again, reversing a downward trend. The big six mortgage lenders increased rates slightly on the average two-year fixed rate mortgage last week. It now stands at 4.65%. The cost of a mortgage is likely to climb higher if the Bank of England keeps raising rates to fight inflation. Now, Anna, that seems to be the core of the issue around the world when mm. it comes to the property sector, but extra uh, tough for citizens of the UK who are already dealing with a, a cost of living crisis. Right. I mean, uh, the, the, and what we saw here, of course, was that these rates jumped around the time of that October so-called mini budget. Uh, and then they dropped back down again. They sort of normalized after that. And, and we had a change of management, as we know, here in the UK. But then that still meets a rising tide of interest rates globally and not least from the Bank of England. So rates still uh, generally seem to be ticking higher or at least have returned to doing so. Coming up on the program, we'll get back to that Aramco story as it introduces that additional dividend. We'll dive into what that means for the uh, Saudi government, for the oil giants, uh, uh, business business and uh, much beyond. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now, the PIMCO co-founder Bill Gross says rather than buying or selling banks, investors are better off selling volatility of uh, regional lenders. Gross spoke on Bloomberg yesterday. You know, we've got a situation where there's value, but we've also got a situation where uh, investors are still leery based upon uh, deposits and the lack of deposits. And so talk to us why then we're talking about an ETF. Obviously, if you look at the regional bank landscape as a whole, there's been some specific names that have really seen the brunt of the action. PacWest in particular over the past week uh, has been extremely volatile. So if you're looking at this situation evolving, does it make more sense to go into something like KRE that tracks all of these names versus trying to pick one? Well, I think for the conservative investor, it does. The, the diversification is a 
positive and K area is not as volatile as some of the ones that you mentioned. That's not what I've done. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think buying the stocks or shorting the stocks is really not the way to go from here. I think what you want to do is sell the volatility in this particular sector. The volatility on many of these stocks is um, extraordinary. Uh, on uh, PacWest, it's uh, 300 uh, normalized, which uh, I know is technical, but is extremely high uh, volatility. And it's the same thing on many other stocks. I've, I've been selling volatility on uh, Western Alliance, that's uh, WLAL, and on Zion. Um, both of those uh, volatilities are um, much higher than normal, higher than 100. And, you know, should the market simply stabilize, which is what I'm talking about, which what I'm thinking at these lower levels, then a two-week or a month-and-a-half option, um, what I call a strangle, you know, selling a put, selling a call at 10% above and 10% below, you know, they provide a very, very potentially profitable um, investment as opposed to simply buying the stock or selling the stock. Well, PIMCO co-founder Bill Gross there with some pretty interesting recommendations, not necessarily buying and selling the shares, but selling the volatility of the banks instead. And speaking of volatility, shares of Aramco jumped after the company said it would introduce an additional dividend, potentially boosting payouts for Saudi Arabia's government by billions of dollars. Bloomberg Saudi Arabia Bureau Chief Matthew Martin joins us now from Riyadh. Matthew, uh, talk to us about the story. Why is Aramco changing its dividend payout when a good chunk of Wall Street and global Wall Street is saying, oil prices are only going to go down from here. Yeah, well, Aramco has been coming under pressure for quite some time to return more cash to shareholders. Um, the, the, the investors who take up the, uh, the small 2% stake or so, which is freely traded, uh, feel like they're not rewarded enough. Uh, the dividend yield has only been around the 4% region for a long time. Uh, so that's not rewarding enough for those shareholders. And also the Saudi government as well is embarking on this massive uh, diversification uh, projects at the moment. And so it needs more cash as well. So I think both those forces have come together to encourage the, uh, the company to do more in terms of returning more cash to shareholders. And we've seen it over the past um, over the past year, obviously, oil prices very high last year. It generated a huge amount of cash. Uh, and, uh, and so now it's looking at being able to return more of that to those shareholders and increase liquidity in the, in the stock. Mm, OK. And, and where, who, where does the money go? Who stands to benefit? This is about the Saudi government as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The government still owns 90% of the shares. It's forecast to have a, a small deficit uh, this year in the government budget. So increasing the dividend is probably going to help cover up that deficit this year. Uh, there's also um, around 8% of the stock is now owned as well by the Sovereign Wealth Fund. And um, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, the PIF, has obviously been investing a huge amount of money domestically and internationally. And so having that uh, income stream from, uh, from the, this Aramco stake uh, and these higher dividends now is going to help it fund all of that. So this is going to be uh, a very good news day for the Saudi government and for uh, the, the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, as they look at collect these uh, bumper takings from Aramco. Matthew, put this into perspective for our global audience here. You talked about just how good this is for the Saudi government. Why do they need this? Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, the Saudi budget here. Yeah, so the, um, last year the government had the first surplus in, uh, in almost a decade. This year the government was forecasting a, uh, a, another surplus. However, a lot of analysts have become a lot more sceptical about that and said that uh, Saudi Arabia probably needs oil prices in the region of $80 a barrel uh, or perhaps higher to be able to balance the books. Uh, the, the spending plans that have been announced on these various projects like um, uh, NEOM, um, like the uh, other tourism projects and other economic diversification projects, probably run into the trillions of dollars. So clearly the government needs to be able to find cash where it can to be able to fund these things because so far the foreign investment into those projects has not been coming. So uh, th I think this, uh, this, this move that we've seen from Aramco in, in shifting the dividend calculation is all part of ma helping make sure that there's more money flowing from oil revenues into these entities which are funding economic diversification projects, which is really key for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, as he tries to embark on this reform drive that he started.
Okay, Matthew, thank you very much. Uh, a long-running story then in terms of that diversification. Matthew Martin joining us from Riyadh. Coming up on the programme, we'll get back to today's markets. Rukeya Ibrahim joins us, BCA Research Daily Insights Strategist. How concerned is she uh, about the, the uh, drop that we saw in demand for credit in the US economy on top of uh, a tick up in, in sort of tight credit conditions from those who provide it? We'll talk about credit in the US markets, how that uh, feeds into perhaps the Fed conversation as well. What does that mean for how soon or late we see cuts in rates from the Fed. This is Bling Bank. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. U.S. banks reported tighter standards and weaker demands for loans in the first quarter. That was before some of the recent stress in the banking sector emerged. UBS is overhauling its top management team following the takeover of Credit Suisse. The CFO's being replaced and Credit Suisse CEO Ulrich Karner will join the UBS executive board. And a crucial meeting at the White House today over the debt limit stalemate. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell says he's not coming to President Biden's rescue with some sort of secret plan. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot to digest stateside, but of course the European session is going to certainly influence how the trade pans out here. Walk us through what we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some weakness coming through on European equity markets as we've seen a little bit of that weakening in uh, U.S. futures. Uh, we've gone down in sympathy perhaps here, but down by six tenths of one percent. Uh, we've seen a more resilient start to the trading day. The London market was closed yesterday, had to play a little bit of catch up, tried to stay positive, but has succumbed to the downside. And most sectors now in negative territory. So we find ourselves down around six tenths of one percent on the stocks Europe 600. Here's that uh, that uh, the Swedish commercial real estate business, actually a large player in the commercial real estate business, SBB, as it is locally known uh, and thankfully for those who cannot say that in Swedish but the stock itself really interesting is down by 11 percent today uh, and it's been seen as quite a canary in the coal mine for well the Swedish commercial real estate sector but also the broader real estate sector in in Europe as well uh, this is because it has quite a lot of floating rate uh, notes that it needs to refinance in 2023 and of course as rates have been rising globally that becomes more expensive in particular for this business because it was downgraded yesterday to junk overnight they then said that they were cutting back on the dividend or, or delaying the dividend rather so as a result the stock drops quite substantially here's the euro uh, down two tenths of a percent at 109.83 kind of stalled around that 110 mark haven't we since we've got that ecb rate decision we had uh, heard from martins kazakhs at the ecb and he's been saying that the central bank can continue to hike rates even if we see not just a pause at the fed but a fed that is cutting interest rates which is an interesting thought whether we see that timing mismatch would be a really interesting market development but for the moment uh, the stock uh, sorry the uh, the currency not responding too much to that kind of thought process. Uh, Brent crude is at 76.39. We started last week, of course, Critty, uh, with uh, a Brent crude price around 80, dropped down as much to as low as 73, now back up at 76. A lot of volatility in oil prices. Yeah, it's certainly something you are seeing stateside as well, And uh, We'll start from bottom up here. Uh, for a radio audience, stick with me. We're looking at NYMEX crude. Anna just meant to, mentioned 76 on Brent. NYMEX at trading at a 72 handle, so still seeing about uh, that $4 premium there. Still down by 8 tenths of 1% stateside. And that really, again, speaks to the idea of the recessionary story. If you are worried about a recession in the states, it is going to show them up in the NYMEX pricing, certainly something to keep an eye on. But look, they're also factoring in the dollar, and that's really where you see it kind of unchanged today, despite the fact that yields are ticking lower. On the front end of the curve, two-year yield really testing that 4% level. We're at 398 there, two-year yield coming back down. It's interesting, though, that you are seeing this bid for the bond market, even as the equity market sells off. And I think a lot of that comes, Anna, from the flow that you just mentioned in Europe specifically. Sentiment around the world souring today, whether it's the banks, whether it's the debt ceiling, uh, whether it's uh, the Swedish story in in Europe, it kind of feels like the vibe, for lack of a better term, or to quote, quote Austin <laughs> Goolsby of the Chicago Fed, is sell and pursue a little bit of safety. Mm, we can certainly deal with vibes, can't we? Uh, <laughs> Critty, let's uh, move on to our next conversation. Uh, Rakaia Ibrahim joins us, BCA Research Daily Insights Strategist. Rakaia, very nice to have you with us. So the vibe does seem to be fairly negative, certainly sitting here in Europe, down six tenths of a percent on the stocks, 600, Rakaia. Is this the debt ceiling narrative weighing on sentiment? It is, is it right that the debt ceiling uh, weighs here? To some extent, we've seen stocks shake off concerns around the debt ceiling, whereas we've seen the short end of the Treasury curve actually pricing in some, uh, some volatility or at least being moved by this story. How do you see this playing out for markets? 
Yeah, I do think that that's reasonable to expect some volatility on the back of the debt ceiling. I mean, unlike the 2011 and 2013 episode, um, uh, uh, policy polarization is much higher right now in the U.S. And what we're likely going to see is even if we do ultimately um, avoid a crisis, there's going to be some brink brinkmanship in the lead up to it. And that's going to lead to some volatility. Um, and that's justifying those moves. So I think that, you know, inv investors this time around should be paying attention to what happens in 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 the um in terms of the debt ceiling in the u.s and like i said that's going to lead to some volatility in equities even if uh the limit is ultimately um resolved mm. and talking of volatility rakaya we saw markets take a moment to understand what the SLU's uh, survey uh, of, of loan officers what what that messaging was really all about yesterday and it was really interesting to see yes there were some institutions that were dialing back the availability of credit to their borrowers but there were there was also a really notable pullback in demand for credit at the time when we saw a lot of tension around the banking sector so perhaps that's that makes sense but what do you see as the sort of wider implications of a pullback in credit either supply or demand in the United States? Right, and remember, this was this has been going on before we even saw this March um, bank tumult. We've been seeing, you know, loan demand weaken. We've been seeing banks tightening lending standards even prior to that. So this is a continuation of this trend, um, and it's not really unexpected. On the one hand, we have the Fed continuing to tighten interest rates, and on the other hand, we are seeing these. The, this bank stress emerging. And so, you know, what we're likely to see as a result of this, even if the regional bank um, issues are resolved, is this continuing tightening of lending standards, that's going to be a drag on economic growth. And that's really what we're most concerned about over a cyclical horizon. Um, and, you know, I think what's also interesting from the SLUs that came out is that banks also expect this to continue throughout 2023 on the back of, you know, economic uncertainty, a deterioration in the economic environment, um, you know, so this is going to continue to be a story going forward. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it just ultimately reflects the fact that, you know, the Fed has been tightening policy so much this year. So something is ultimately going to have to break. And this is what we're starting to see some cracks right now. Well, when you talk about something having to break, at what point does that turn into an all-out recession? I think from the market's perspective, from an equities perspective, that earnings recession is in the rearview mirror. But if you look at it from an economic perspective, we've been warning about the R word for, I want to say, two years now. How long is this going to drag out? Yeah, what's very interesting about the U.S. economy right now is we're seeing this divergence between the service sector and the manufacturing sector. So the service sectors, and that's like very clear from the PMIs that came out last week, service sector in the U.S. as well as in other places around the world, including China, uh, those are doing still quite well. They're in expansionary territory, whereas manufacturing is in contraction. And so this pent-up demand for services is continuing to support the economy, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing things like strong labor market um, uh, reports, even though we've been worried about uh, recession and indicators have been pointing to recession for quite a few months now. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's very difficult to time a recession and there's, you know, um, no way of knowing exactly what's going when that's going to happen. But it's 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 looking increasingly likely over a 12 month horizon. And that's that's our base case for remaining cautious on equities over a 12 month horizon. So what's the trade then? What are you, if you are going to be cautious on equities, what do you actually buy here in a decelerating uh, economically growth environment? Uh, it feels like the go-to has always been buy big tech. Is that the mantra that people should still be following? Yeah, I think the IT sector is probably to poised to do better than other sectors, uh, given the fact that it is a growth, it's defense, it's relatively defensively skewed, it's high quality. So that should help protect the IT sector uh, over the coming 12 months. In general, we're favoring defensive sectors over cyclical ones, like, for example, industrials, materials, those ones we don't, we don't really favor. And in terms of, you know, just asset allocation, uh, you know, government bonds are poised to do better than equities overall. Uh, so that's what we would be recommending in terms of positioning. Mm, and in terms of European assets, uh, the euro fairly range bound at the moment around the sort of one, uh, 109, 110 level, Rukaya. Uh, but we've heard from some at the ECB that they think the ECB can keep hiking uh, even as the Fed not only pauses, but maybe gets to the point where it cuts rates. I mean, could you see that divergence in policy coming to pass? And, and how strong would the euro get in, in that situation? 
I mean, the message from the ECB that we got last week is that, you know, Christine Lagarde, she point blank said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, interest rates, although she, they, she does believe they're at restrictive territory, they're not sufficiently restrictive, which signals that, you know, she's, they're, the ECB is most likely going to hike again in June and maybe again in July as well. Now, if that does pan out, uh, you know, we would characterize that as a policy mistake. It would raise the risks of a policy mistake in the in the euro area, which would be uh, negative for risk assets in the eurozone, um, you know, because ultimately inflation is a lagging indicator and wages are a lagging indicator. And these are really the, the indicators that the ECB has been focused on right now. Whereas if you take a look at credit conditions in the in the euro area, not unlike in the U.S., uh, we got the the, um, the the survey for the eurozone last week, and that also showed that credit conditions continue to tighten in the eurozone, which reflects the tightening in monetary policy that we've seen in the eurozone. Uh, now, having said that, you know what we're we don't actually don't expect the Fed to cut interest rates this this year unless the economy is in recession. And so in that sense, I think that there is scope for investors to dial back the pricing and the interest rates for the rest of this year that shows that, you know, the Fed is going to cut interest rates this year. And that could actually uh, lead to some support for the dollar relative to the euro um, over the near term. Okay, thanks so much, Rakaya. Good to speak to you. Rakaya Ibrahim of BCA Research with her thoughts on the markets. Coming up, we'll work out how politics affects the markets right now. Congressional leaders are meeting at the White House today to try to solve the debt limit stalemate. Can they? Up next, we will speak with Greg Valliere, Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with B of A Securities Europe CEO Vanessa Holtz. That's at 10.30 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. I think it's ridiculous. Um, I, you know, it, it's always resolved and not that it's a 100 percent chance, but I, I think it gets resolved. I would suggest for those that are uh, less concerned and uh, similar to myself that they, uh, you know, they buy a one month, uh, two month Treasury bill at a much higher rate than they get with a longer term Treasury bill. PIMCO co-founder Bill Gross there speaking with Bloomberg yesterday on the debt limit debate. His comments come as President Biden prepares to host House Speaker Kevin McCarthy as well as other congressional leaders over at the White House today to try to resolve the impasse over the debt ceiling. Joining us now is Greg Vallier, AGF Investments Chief, U.S. Policy Strategist. Greg, look, it looks like Wall Street, which for so long was brushing off the debt ceiling issue, is now starting to hold its breath. What are the odds we actually get some sort of deal after this meeting? Uh, zero. I, I don't think there's any chance there's a there's a deal today. Uh, I think they could come out and say we're going to redouble our efforts. We're going to work harder. Uh, we are adamantly opposed to default. They they might have some soothing rhetoric, but the idea of a deal, I got to tell you, I think that's weeks or months away before we actually do get a deal. I think they're going to have to kick the can down the road and extend this into the fall. How is that possible, though, if though if we're talking about hitting the limit uh, June 1st, I believe, if we do indeed go to the fall, as you say, what do the order of events look like? What do these next few months look like? Well, same as before, I think, you know, lots of rhetoric between both sides, lots of alarmist talk about what a default would do to our economy, uh, a, lots of, a lot of stonewalling. And I think an awful lot of speculation about Kevin McCarthy. Does he have enough support among his troops? Uh, he's on a very, very short leash. And I think that he doesn't have a lot of flexibility to, to, to ease up on the plan they passed a couple of months ago. Um, and uh, um, I mean, are you looking at a short term extension then, Greg? Is that what it looks like to get us to the fall? Is, is that what we have to factor in here? In which case, I'm trying to think whether the market puts this one to one side until the fall and then revisits it. Well, I think the stock market would. As we've seen in the last few days, uh, Treasury yields uh, have gone up. But I, I think the, the stock market would, would probably be happy to see this doesn't uh, become a crisis until the fall. Uh, and that might give them an opportunity to actually get a, a decent deal. But uh, th this, to me, 
means that it, it increases the cynicism and the frustration uh, in the in the markets that we've got to go through this for such a, a long time. Mm, and you actually put quite a high percentage chance on a default, Greg. Talk us through your thinking there. Yeah, I've been at 60-40 that we get a deal uh, since the winter. I st I'm still comfortable at 60-40. 40 is high. I mean, that's that's a little nerve-wracking to think there's a 40% chance of a default. I think before we get there, there's going to be one last look at a lot of gimmicks, not just kicking the can. But I think they'll look at the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which has a really intriguing sentence that claims that we, we, we have to pay our debts. Uh, they might even look at minting a, a $1 trillion coin. Uh, there's all sorts of regulatory action that could occur. So I think we've got to go through all of these gimmicks. And I would add, Congress is on vacation a lot. They're out for much of the rest of May. They're out for uh, uh, the second half of the summer. So there's not a lot of time. I think we get to Labor Day and then things really heat up. Greg, I love that you mentioned that a good chunk of Congress will be on vacation because now I'm wondering in the meantime, as this is all sorted out, of course we have, we're going to be on default watch, uh, as you say. What about things like paying pensions, paying government salaries, uh, funding for museums, the Smithsonian's, for example? How does that all play out? Well, th that's a big, big issue if we get to a, a drop dead date and we don't get a deal, whether it's in June or whether it's in September. If there's no deal, then you, you have a lot of uh, government spending uh, frozen. And I think in particular, Social Security is going to be a big, big issue. I think the, the politicians are going to make it clear to senior citizens that this, they could be vulnerable. And that'll put pressure on Congress to do something. When I talk to some investors about this, Greg, they describe it as fairly binary. You know, you ask, is there any point really in preparing for an outcome like a, a U.S. debt default no. because of the impact that it would have? And they describe it as fairly binary. But the, the description you give is something a little more complicated than that, especially if other, if some of the more uh, creative or, or you could call them gimmicks, as, as you suggest, if we go down any of those paths. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it would be... Uh, a, a bigger concern for the fixed income market. But let, let me just make this point. To my surprise, the stock market has not really been affected by this at all. The market has other things to worry about, Federal Reserve policy, things like that. But the markets, I think, still have a sanguine view that at the last minute, as we saw in 2011, we'll get a deal. I have a view that at the very last minute, if it looks like there'll be a default, the Fed would have to get involved. I think Jerome Powell would be aghast and very upset. He calls this a loathsome option. But in desperate times, you take desperate measures. And at the very last minute, I wouldn't be shocked to see the Fed get involved. Mm, he did recently say, though, there's little they can do to protect the economy. Uh, say again? There's little that they can do to protect the economy at the Fed. Jerome Powell said that at the press conference last time. Yeah, and, and I think that the, the Fed knows that the implications of uh, default are so horrible for global markets that the Fed would have to do something. Maybe they'd have to buy bonds that are imminently uh, going to default. But that's way down the road. I think we'd, we'd probably wait until the fall before we get something that radical. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Greg Vallier of AGF Investments uh, with his thoughts on the debt ceiling. Coming up later today, U.S. Representative Brad Sherman, a Democrat from California. That's a, a conversation we bring you at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. London. This is Big Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now, let's take a look at what is ahead today. Uh, before the U.S. market open, we will get uh, Fox. The focus for that report will be at the impact, of course, on Tucker Carlson's departure and Fox's settlement with Dominion Voting Systems. What does that do to the numbers? At 12 p.m. Eastern time, New York Fed President John Williams will be speaking to the Economic Club of New York. Airbnb and Rivian are among the companies reporting after the bell. And today, 
Today's main event, U.S. President Joe Biden is scheduled to meet Speaker Kevin McCarthy and other congressional leaders to discuss the debt ceiling. Although, as we were hearing from Greg Vallier, he doesn't expect a deal imminently then, Chrissy, uh, to come from this meeting. And I know that you're looking at uh, some of the things that are moving more imminently in pre-market trade. Yeah, on the macro front, everyone kind of staying a little bit frozen, to your point, Anna. But on the micro, a lot of movement. Palantir, for example, is one of the stocks that I'm watching this morning. PLTR for our radio audience is the ticker. Look, they came out with earnings yesterday after the bell, and they said their demand for AI is unprecedented. The shares moving about 19% in the pre-market. Anna, all they had to say was AI, that, and yeah. that shot the stock That's up enough. higher. I mean, I was talking about a business here in Europe, uh, Pearson, of a very different nature, but they were talking about AI and working that into their business. And yeah, lo and behold, that sent the stock higher as well. Um, what about PayPal? We've had news flow around that one. Yeah, PayPal's another major one. Look, they also came out with their earnings. And look, they beat them. You're already seeing this become a major theme where a lot of these stocks are beating their earnings. They even raised their profit outlook for 2023. Ordinarily, Anna, that would be a positive thing. Instead, the shares are down about 4% in the pre-market. They're saying that their margin outlook is actually coming in significantly weaker. So getting punished by the street there. And the semiconductor uh, devices business that is Skyworks, that seems to be making some news. Yeah, Skyworks we know and love from being the Apple supply chain. It's one of those stories I love to see every time they have the iPhone demand story or, or a geopolitical story. Skyworks gets hit alongside Apple, along with likes of, likes of Cirrus, for example, or Qualcomm. So this is that chip maker that's down about 10%. Look, they matched Wall Street estimates, but they also missed their outlook. Now, look, this is a stock that's been under a lot of pressure uh, since Apple announced that they're going to go in-house for developing their chips. But Anna, for me, this is extra interesting because we like to look at the likes of Caterpillar or John Deere stateside as these global bellwethers. Uh, but I would say chip makers like Skyworks turning mm. into more of a global bellwether. They actually warned about a little bit of headwinds when it comes to not the Apple iPhone, but the Android instead. And that's where they're seeing a few hiccups. Yeah, talking of uh, global bellwethers, we heard from Komatsu yesterday uh, 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 in the same market as Caterpillar, of course, often seen as bellwethers for that part of the uh, of the market. And they weren't all that positive on China, which is interesting, especially when you look at the uh, where we saw the weak points in the Chinese export import data overnight. It's been really interesting, though, the way that stocks have been pretty range bound through the month of, well, certainly the latter part of April and into May. Then, Chrissy, we've had maybe some positive earnings stories or at least bearable earnings stories uh, in the face of negative expectations expectation that have offset some of the concerns around the banking sector. Maybe stocks have been really quite surprisingly resilient through all of that. They have, and it really all comes down to the E-word efficiency. And we heard it from the likes of Mark Zuckerberg, for example, saying this would be the year of efficiency and really rewarded by the stock market for it. And that's why the margin story is so important, because even though we're now talking not about bottom line growth, but top line growth, margins are still turning out to be the Achilles heels for a lot of these companies that are actually performing quite well. Yeah, and it's all about some margin sustainability as well. Uh, we hear from some of our guests, uh, not just what they can do now, but what they'll do in the future. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. Uh, they'll be hearing from Oppenheimer uh, uh, during the program. Uh, lots to talk about as uh, we uh, continue coverage of the debt ceiling debate over in the United States and get ready for CPI data tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.